You're welcome to uh, the show today. Today's Friday, Bible Talks. And if you've been following the series so far, then you are aware that we've been doing the Gifts of the Spirit series for the past couple of weeks. And today is the last segment of this series, uh, the Gifts of the Spirit series. I am so excited to be here with you again uh, this Friday, uh, which is arguably my, my favorite segment of the show. Yes, so... Uh, one thing I will mention today is that if you are here and you've been following the series, um, if you are if you are among us those that have followed from the very beginning of the Gifts of the Spirit series, and you are here today, you are blessed because uh, a lot of of stuff has been reserved for this last segment. I'm going to explain quite a number of things. I'm going to uh, break down a couple of scriptures for you and bring you to a place of understanding. You know, the Bible in the book of Ephesians says, uh, praying unto God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know the hope of your calling. And this is a prayer I have for you today, that uh, God will give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling and the greatness of his power to us word who believe. This is my prayer for you, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened because we'll get into a number of things uh, in the scriptures today regarding diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, praying in tongues, praying in the spirit, we'll get into all that and we'll get into how we can partner with, with the Holy Spirit in, in prayer and in ministering this gift. We'll also clarify a number of things, answer a number of questions that people have had for years. I know tongues have been uh, made to become a Pentecostal, <laughs> a Pentecostal thing within the church, church uh, circles. I once I saw someone post on Facebook not too long ago saying, which is to say, you, the, the, the Roman Catholics have now become, uh, what, what word can, can translate that? Enlightened. And the, that they are, some of them are now speaking in tongues. Well, that was a joke. Uh, speaking in tongues is meant for every single believer. You may be Pentecostal, you may be Seventh-day Adventist, you may be Roman Catholic, you may be from the Presbyterian church, uh, you may be from the Anglican church, you may be from various denominations, but this, this ability to pray in tongues or speak in tongues is, is accessible to every believer. If you understand, uh, remember Jesus Christ in the book of Luke says, if you being evil are able to give to your children good things, and if your child asks you for bread, you will not give him a serpent. And if he asks you for an egg, you will not give him a stone. You being evil have the ability to give to your children good gifts when they ask. How much more will your father in heaven, being good, not give unto you the Holy Spirit? If you ask, Jesus says this, that anyone who asks from God for the Holy Spirit. God being good will give. If we being evil are able to give to our children good gifts, then how much more will God being good give unto us the Holy Spirit when we ask? And last week we established how that there was the Tower of Babel and God confused their languages and we can see right from uh, the Tower of Babel, the city that they were trying to build that was later named the Tower of Babel after God came down and confused their languages. We can see how that this, this trend progressed all the way through the scriptures where there's a contrary kingdom that the enemy has always tried to establish. 
uh, in the earth. And when we, re- when we read the book of Daniel, we can see God giving the enemy a time frame uh, of, of 70 weeks, which according to, according to Gabriel, the angel who appeared to Daniel, uh, all the way from Daniel chapter 7, when you, when, you, when, you, when you read that passage of scripture, you will realize that uh, Gabriel said 70 years have been, 70 weeks have been determined upon your people. And this period uh, is, is also, is an interpretation of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw with the different, with, with the different um, material, a head of gold, uh, a chest of silver, a waist of brass, legs of iron and feet of iron mixed with clay. And Gabriel interprets this as four different kingdom ages that would come before the final kingdom of of Christ is established on the earth. So we do know then that because there has been a quest for the enemy to build a contrary city, uh, God gave the enemy a time frame with which to work. And these kingdoms have been established and broken down and established and broken down and new kingdoms have emerged. And even now we are living in a, in an age within that, within that time period, right? So we explained all these things. We explained how that the kingdom of God then, which is promised at the end of this time frame that the enemy has been given. If you guys haven't read the book of Daniel, then you would do yourself good to read that. Daniel also had a dream of four beasts, uh, which similarly was interpreted to be four different kingdoms that would emerge. And the last one being a beast that would form 10 kingdoms and one smaller horn, which is a final kingdom, which would then produce uh, the Antichrist. Okay, so we we will be getting into an end time series, obviously, uh, not too long from now, this very year, I'll give you an end time series. It will be quite a long series, uh, maybe 15 part, 20 part. I don't know because I have a lot to say uh, on that particular uh, subject, the end times. I want to explain to you right from the start to the end and I'll explain to you when, what will happen. And we'll do this all from the scriptures because it's all revealed in the scriptures. Uh, So we'll give you an end time series. But for now we are concluding diverse kinds of tongues. And last week we established how that God promised a kingdom that would come whose establishment would be Jesus Christ himself. And uh, we also uh, talked about how when Jesus Christ came uh, the first time uh, prior to his crucifixion, his message, his one message that he consistently preached was the kingdom of God. And we know that Jesus gave various analogies of the kingdom of God. He said, the kingdom of God is like unto a man. The kingdom of God is like unto a king. The kingdom of God is like unto, he said so many things about the kingdom of God. And he also said, repent and turn away from your sins and believe in the gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, if we break down the meaning of the word gospel, the gospel is the good news. The literal translation from the Greek gospel, eugelion, nearly too good to be true. Nearly too good to be true. That's the message that Jesus brought. And at the end of his message, he talked about the kingdom. If you receive me, you become citizens of the kingdom. That's good news. This is the good news that we should preach to the ends of the world. As a matter of fact, Jesus says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the corners of the world and then I will return. So the kingdom of God was Jesus' primary focus and we discussed how that this kingdom um, is coming and prior to us seeing the full manifestation of the kingdom of God on the earth, God sent a governor. We also gave examples of how that uh, the kingdom of um, of Britain the United Kingdom and many other kingdoms in the world, especially in the west, Western parts of, uh, of the world, prior to colonizing countries would send a governor who would introduce a language. And so you will notice that when you go to British colonies, they speak English and to the extent that they've made it their official language. When you go to 
French colonies, they speak French. When you go to Portuguese colonies, they speak Portuguese. And all these things are a, a type, a testament of the real thing. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth, the reality. This world that we are living in presently is but a dream. It's, it's the rehearsal of the real thing because Jesus is the reality. He's the one that came to wake us up into the real world, the kingdom of God. And when the kingdom of God, the real world is established here on earth, the consequences of our lives now will reflect then. And so what God has done is to establish methods for us to not only contribute to what our lives will be in that kingdom when that time comes. Remember Jesus said, some who are great now will be small then, and some who are small now will be great then, right? Now, in order for us to determine what kind of a life we'll have then, what we do now is very important. Not only that, but in order for us to bring from the kingdom of God, which presently to us is spiritual while we live in a physical world, for us to bring resources from that kingdom into our world, there are channels uh, through which God has made available these things, right? I'll read you the first, uh, the first scripture today, which, which kind of does give us an explanation into this. Uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. It means there is no blessing that we lack, but there's a problem. Number one, the material with which the blessing is, the material of the blessing is spiritual. So God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. The second thing, the second problem that we seem to face is the location of, of these blessings, right? God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Yes, that we understand. In the heavenly places. <laughs> so then how do we transact? How do we bring these spiritual blessings into a physical manifestation? How do we change their location from heavenly places to the earth? Uh, if you followed my earlier, 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 earlier teachings on, on Bible talks, uh, I, I, I described to you firstly how that there are two worlds, two realms, the natural realm and the, and the spirit realm, the world of spirits, right? Uh, secondly, I, I explained to you how uh, the spirit realm is the source of the natural realm, which means the value in the spirit realm would, would definitely be heavier than the, the value here because the natural realm is it's perishable. The natural realm has a start and an end. The spirit realm doesn't, doesn't really work that way. So in order for you to get into that place and extract what you have there and bring it here, then you need to establish a connection between the spirit realm and the natural realm. You need to establish a connection. Okay, I'll give you an example. If England sends to Zambia a governor to first go and make sure that the Zambians are able to understand English in order for the principles, the rules, the plans of the, of the queen of Britain or the monarchy to be established in Zambia, there must be some form of understanding in order to bring people into conformity. So now, if Zambians have then... Uh, the opportunity to go and study in Britain as university students, because there's this connection that has been established. There's one thing that they'll definitely need, it's knowledge of English. In the same way, this trend has continued till today. If I want to travel to the UK for the purposes of, of university, I'll need to go through English, uh, is it proficiency or efficiency tests? tests that can guarantee that indeed this person that is coming to our country to learn is capable of learning because he understands the, the language, 
And he's also capable of living in our environment because he understands the language. So then what does language do? Language introduces you into a culture. It exposes you because the way people say things reveals a lot about their lifestyles. So the governor of the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, who is the one that establishes a connection between the natural realm and the spirit realm, because Christ is no longer here with us. He said, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you helpless. I will not leave you comfortless, but I'll send unto you the comforter, the spirit of truth, that he will lead you into all the truth and remind you of things to come. And what is mine, he will give unto you, for what is the father's is mine. So what Jesus is saying is that there is a connection established because now I'm going to heaven between me in heaven where our blessings are, our spiritual blessings are, and you on earth, because a part of you is spirit. And so the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in the part of you that is spirit in order to be able to teach you how to extract from the spirit realm your blessings and convert them into the natural realm. And that process is the same process that happened when God planted the word of God into Mary's womb. Remember who was responsible for Mary's pregnancy? It was the Holy Spirit. Because God planted by his spirit, the word of God into Mary's womb and the word became. If you're listening to me and you're attentive, say the word became. In case you're seated there and you have a neighbor next to you, tell your neighbor the word became. So the word has the ability to become flesh. Right? So this word, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. These spiritual blessings that have been declared to us by the word of God have the ability to become flesh, tangible. We can touch them, but we need the Holy Spirit to be able to plant that seed into us for it to be, for us to give birth to it in this natural realm, okay? I had to establish my, my, hypothe my hypothesis before I get into the meat of it because I need you to, to really follow me closely and understand. So I'm going to begin to, to, to read you a couple of scriptures so we get into um, the subject of diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the spirit, to another gifts of healings by the spirit, by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So one thing we have also established throughout the gifts of the spirit series is that each and every gift, uh, each and every manifestation of the spirit that is described to us as a gift, whether it's prophecy, discerning of spirits, uh, diverse kinds of tongues, whether it's word of wisdom or word of knowledge, is a proper packaging of an actual spiritual ability. I like to say it this way, because God created us in, a, in his image after his likeness, in his image, according to his likeness, right? That's what, that's what God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. The image of God being what we look like is a physical reflection of God's spiritual abilities. So if we have legs, it shows us that God is mobile somehow. It may not necessarily mean that God walks with his legs as we do, but the physical presence of legs on our body is a spiritual reflection of God's ability to move, to walk. How he does it is not the question. It's the fact that he can do it. You know, the Bible says that God is strong because God is resourceful. 
When you talk about God, you're talking about a cluster of spirits, God and the establishment of his kingdom. God is resourceful. He's created worlds in which he's able to tap into resources. God does not need to get up from his throne to have a complicated matter done because he has spent eternity establishing a kingdom that is able to work without him having to get off of his, off of his throne. That, that's why it was so special that God had to come down and die. And the Bible says God was manifested in the flesh, seen by angels, preached on in the world, taken up into glory, justified in the spirit. So every single spiritual gift is a packaging of an actual spiritual ability. So when you talk about prophecy, for example, this gift gives you the ability to see into the future. When in fact, in God's world, that's not a gift, it's a natural ability. God can see into the future. I had explained to you also in one of my earlier Bible talks that if you became a four-dimensional being and time suddenly became a dimension that you can perceive, then you will realize that looking into the past and into the future will no longer be a spiritual gift. It will be no more. Because if, the, if, if angels are four-dimensional beings, then they don't need to open up our bodies in order to look inside. But spiritual gifts are a packaging of a spiritual ability. And so when we talk about diverse kinds of tongues, different kinds of tongues, this is a, a, a spiritual packaging, a packaging of a spiritual ability that is given to a man and is able to use this gift in a moment when it is needed. And so it's important to establish also early enough that there is a difference between speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. There's a difference between speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. <sighs> Let's get into the scriptures. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse one to four. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. All right, so this uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're going to go through almost the, whole, almost the whole chapter. Not the whole chapter, we'll skip some verses, but we'll go through uh, this chapter together and I'll show you a couple of things. Firstly, it says, he who speaks in an unknown tongue, it defies himself. But he who prophesies, it defies the church. When we get into a place of, um, of prayer and a place of interaction with God, we begin to graduate from going before God every time to make requests. Uh, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. Lord, bless my family my father, my child, my uncle, my auntie, my grandparents, bless my business. There is a lot of my in your prayer. Lord, heal my, bless my, protect my, keep my, there's a lot of my in your prayer. This is at the earlier stages of your, of your walk with the Lord because in the earlier stages, you have just realized that there is a God. The Bible says, he that comes to God must believe that he is and he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. So you have believed that he is. Okay, there is a God. You have believed in Jesus Christ, yes. And you have just discovered that there's prayer in the name of Jesus, which actually produces results. And in the beginning, you will see the results, regardless of how you pray, because you're a baby. But as you begin to grow in your walk with the Lord, you begin to discover different sides to prayer. 
Now you know about intercession. That, oh, I can pray for others. Now you know about warfare. That we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now you know about the prayers of worship. Now you know about the prayers of inquiry. David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and pursue and overtake? And the Lord says, pursue, overtake. That's a prayer of inquiry. The Bible says, and so inquired of the Lord and the Lord was quiet. He neither answered him by dream or by urim or by nothing. Because there are different kinds of prayer. There is not only one kind of prayer. The Bible actually says in the book of Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests. Prayer, supplication, make your requests. What is prayer? What is supplication? And what is requests? So there are different kinds of prayer. And amongst these, we find the study of the word of God. We find meditation. But we also find a different level, which is speaking. So you get into prayer and you begin to speak to God. Now, this is, <laughs> this is very important for you to understand that you can actually get into prayer and begin to speak. Now, you're not only speaking to God, you can speak to yourself or to your situation, or you can speak to the environment, you can speak to your day, but basically, you can get into an environment of prayer and begin to speak and not pray. Uh, remember the, the story of Jesus and the centurion who came to him and said, my servant is sick. Realize that Jesus did not actually speak the words, be healed. It was a servant that said, speak only a word. And Jesus says, according to your words. So in the presence of God, you get into the, the place of prayer, you get into your prayer closet, your, your enclosure, wherever you pray from. I would encourage that you have a particular place you, did I just say that? A particular place you pray from, right? If you have a particular place you pray from, then you are going to create an environment within that area. So when you get into that environment, and, and for some of you if, if you, if you've studied the glory of God, then you know that there is the, the residing glory, which can be in a specific location, and there is the, the moving glory. Because uh, when you get to also a place in your spiritual growth and journey with God, you begin to take that environment with you everywhere you go. So the environment is no longer trapped in a, in a specific location. <laughs> Read the story of Moses, for example. Read the story of Moses. Um, read the story of Abraham, the story of Isaac, the story of Jacob, how they had to go to specific locations to meet the Lord. The Lord would tell him, go there and I will meet you there. Or Jacob comes into a place and has a dream of a ladder going into heaven and angels ascending and descending. And he says, I did not know that the Lord was here, yet his father had been to that place already. So God can be in a specific place, go there and I'll meet you there. Or he can move. So Moses graduates and says, I will not go unless your presence goes with me. And so God, God tells him to create, he instructs him on how to host his presence amongst the nation of Israel and migrate with God from the wilderness into the promised land. So God is no longer only in one specific location, but he's now moving with them. And this can become your life because these are types. Remember the, the, the Old Testament, the practices of the old are shadows of things to come. But the body of those shadows is of Christ. So Christ's body cast the shadow on the Old Testament. And now we see the feasts and the practices and the law. All those were shadows of the body. And now that Christ is here, 
Christ is our moving glory. He's given us the spirit of God. But certain principles still work. When you begin to pray in one specific place, you create an environment. And when you grow from there, you begin to move with that environment. Okay. Now, not to, not to take you far away, but once you are in that environment and you begin to speak, regardless of what you are speaking to, it will listen because you are in the presence of God. In the presence of God, your request that you bring to him becomes his decree. So there is a difference between praying and speaking. Now, you can pray in tongues because you're addressing God, but you can speak in tongues because you're not addressing God. You may be addressing God in speaking, but you are not praying as per se. You're not making requests or supplication. You are determining what things should be like. The Bible says, we know by faith that the word of God framed the worlds. Your world can be framed by what you speak. So there's a difference between praying and speaking. And so when you say praying in tongues, it's different from speaking in tongues. And the Bible here is saying, he that speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to men, but to God, because the one who performs the counsel of his servants, the words of his servants, the, ones who, the one who performs is God. So when you speak in an unknown tongue, the only person that is listening to perform what you are saying is God. I hope you're following. But when you prophesy, you're speaking for the edification because remember that prophecy also must produce something in the hearer, must edify them so it enlightens them, gives them a direction in which they should pray, in which they should believe, in which they should wage the war of faith concerning that prophecy. Okay? I hope this is clear to you. Let us move to uh, verse 5 and 6 of the same chapter. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets, that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. Remember, he's saying speaking. He's not talking about praying. Because if you are praying, then you will not be going to someone to pray. You go and speak with someone. You don't go and pray to someone, right? Because you're addressing the person as you're speaking. So you could be teaching them. You could be prophesying to them. You could be speaking by revelation. But if you speak to them in an unknown tongue, it is not beneficial for them. So again, there's a difference between praying and speaking. Both have a place. Speaking in tongues has a place. Praying in tongues has a place. It is where it is done that matters. The location, the place, in whose presence are you doing it? The speaking in tongues or the praying in tongues. That is what determines whether you are doing the correct thing or not. And in the context of this chapter, Paul is teaching about orderliness in the way things are ministered in the church. So that's the context. He's not necessarily addressing the body of Christ and telling them do not speak in tongues because it does not edify anyone. That is not what he's saying. All right? <laughs> that is not what he's saying. Hmm? That is definitely not what, what he's saying. All right. Uh, Moving on, verse, verse 7 to 8. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sound, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? I like the analogy that Paul uses here. If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? <laughs> this reminds me of, of something else that Paul himself said later on. Paul said, on the resurrection day, when the dead in Christ will rise and 
those that remain alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. He says the event that will occur prior to the resurrecting, the changing of bodies, the being caught up in the air, there is one thing that will occur before all this happens. He says the last trump, a trumpet will sound. We will hear it and those that hear the trumpet will be changed. Let me read you the scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, so when you when you study this 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 particular portion of scripture, there are many other scriptures that give more flesh to the skeleton. And as I said earlier, we will look at the end time series soon where I will begin to break down things for you. But the interesting thing is that Paul says a trumpet will sound. And if you read in other scriptures, go all the way to, to, to the books of Corinthians, he talks about how our bodies will be changed. So let me give you this scenario. Jesus Christ descends from heaven, right? He gets into our, our universe, into our space, into our locality, and he gets into the clouds. And he brings with, them the, with him the spirits of those that have died in Christ. And he does not touch the ground, but from the clouds, the spirits locate their bodies on the earth and they begin to pop up from their graves. And here's the thing about how that day will happen. The Bible says he will sound the trumpet and the ones that will hear it first, the ones that will respond first are the dead in Christ because they are with him. They will locate their bodies. You may have built your building, your 11 story building and you, you buried a couple of bodies in the foundation before building it for whatever reason, or you have built your, whatever it is that is so magnificent and mighty to you that you have built and you did not know, or you knew that there are bodies under there in the foundation. Uh, I'm here to tell you, <laughs> your building will not stand. Because when the dead begin to pop out of their graves, it is not a matter of where they were buried or how they were killed or whether they are, their foot was buried in America and their hand was buried in China and their head was buried in Zimbabwe. There is going to be a location where the body is going to assemble and come out of a grave. And if it happens to be under your building, then war unto you. If it happens to be under your 11 story building, then war unto you. But the dead in Christ will rise. And this is going to be the introduction of the season of the wrath of the lamb. So we are not talking about Jesus Christ trying to carefully extract the dead from the ground in order to preserve the lives of those that are not being raptured. Okay, now that's not where my focus is. But the dead in Christ will rise, then their bodies will be changed because we'll receive new bodies. And we who are alive will receive new bodies. And when all of us have received new bodies, we shall now ascend and be caught up to meet the Lord in, in heaven, that they who are dead will not be perfected without us. That's what the Bible says. The interesting thing, is how will we distinguish? How will some hear the trumpet and some will not hear the trumpet? Because we had read a scripture about how Paul says, if a trumpet makes a sound and there's no distinction in the sound, how then will we know that, that, that this sound means let us go to battle, right? Interestingly, he uses the same language when he talks about the, 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 the Lord Jesus returning to, to, to take his church. He says the trumpet will sound. Now, how will we distinguish this trumpet and know it is time to go. I'll read you uh, Revelation chapter four, verse one and two. Now take note that this scripture is the, 
is the last time we hear the church mentioned in the book of Revelation. The church is, is not mentioned after this, during the whole time of the tribulation and the wrath of the Lamb, because obviously the wrath of the Lamb is not meant for the church, but that's a story for another day. Now, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now, John is describing events that took place and that will take place. And I, I, it's important I mentioned to you that the church is not mentioned after this because from my understanding, this is a depiction of the rapture. The trumpet the distinction of the voice of the trumpet. This, this trumpet is not an inanimate object that makes inaudible sounds. So if he blows it like, pam, pa, pa, then it means run, or pam, pa, pam, pa, pa, then it means jump, if, if you get what I mean. That is not necessarily the context, but the trumpet actually speaks words and says, come up here. So when the Bible is talking about Jesus descending with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, this trumpet that will cause the dead to hear and wake up and will cause us who are alive to hear our bodies are changed and we follow him in the clouds. It is an instruction. The trumpet has a distinct sound. It is saying, come up here. This is why some can hear it and some cannot, because it's a distinct voice that is speaking into the spirits of those that can hear. But what causes you to be able to hear and distinguish? It is something that is in your spirit. The Bible in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day. By whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is the seal within us for that day. And the seal within us is what enables us to be able to hear the voice of the trumpet. When the trumpet says, come up here and I will show you what will begin to happen. So we will witness the events that are happening on the earth from above. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let us continue with 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'll read from verse 13 to 18. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Take note, speak and pray. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. So lastly, Paul is saying, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. So that also tells you that Paul is not saying do not speak in tongues. He actually does speak in tongues. What he does is speak tongues in the appropriate places. So Paul there now begins to distinguish. If you speak in a tongue and you don't know what it means, then pray. Okay, he's distinguished speaking from praying. If you speak in a tongue and you do not have the interpretation, then pray that God gives you the interpretation because speaking and praying are two different things. And he now switches from speaking in tongues to praying in tongues. And he says, if I pray in a tongue, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful because the mind does not understand. Again, go back to my earlier teachings. Spirit, soul, body. The spirit, the soul, and the body are three different entities that God has combined in one human being. Your body is the container of your spirit and the soul is your mind, will, and emotions. So your mind, will, and emotions interpret what happens in the natural world because your soul is what is able 
to make you conscious of your natural world and relate to your natural world because you being a spirit cannot function here unless you have a soul. So the soul is more beneficial for your flesh rather than your spirit. But you can bring your soul into conform into conformity, which is a different, which is a different topic altogether. But here now, Paul is distinguishing the spirit praying from the soul's ability to understand what the spirit is saying. And if you want the soul, the mind, to be able to understand what the spirit is saying as the spirit is praying, then you must pray to God to ask for an interpretation. So how, what then? I will pray in the spirit. Now, Paul again switches. He says, if I pray in a tongue, and then he now says, pray in the spirit. So it's the same thing. When you pray in a tongue, you are praying in the spirit. But your mind does not understand. Friends, let us not give up on spiritual, spiritually beneficial things because we do not understand. Now, I mentioned earlier that gifts are, that, that the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us transport things from the spirit realm into the natural realm. And this tool, speaking in diverse kinds of tongues, is a method, a tool, a mechanism through which the Holy Spirit does this. And uh, I'll read you a scripture to that effect a bit later. Let me, let me, let me conclude with, with chapter 14, verse 27 and 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church. Let him speak to himself and to God. You see that again? He's not saying do not speak. What he's saying is do not speak to someone if you do not have an interpretation. So speaking and praying in tongues are very beneficial and very important for your own personal edification. And some of the purposes of, of speaking in tongues are outlined in the scriptures I'll show you now. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for, what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Do you see that? He makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, the problem, the challenge here is you will find it very difficult for you to get into a place of groanings if you have not already begun to pray in the spirit. Because the one who is enabling you, the one who is praying through you in groanings is the Holy Spirit. But the only way the Holy Spirit is given chance to pray, to groan, is when you have begun to pray in your spirit. When you pray in your spirit, you activate the utterance that the spirit gives you. And the spirit of God later on takes over. And this is what is known as praying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible in the book of Jude, let me show it to you. Jude, uh, it's one chapter, so verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in the Holy Spirit, very important. You are unlocking the very potential of God within you when you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. So, tongues, can I just begin to speak in tongues at will? Yes, the Bible says, I will pray in the Spirit. And I will pray in my understanding also. I will sing in the spirit. And I will sing in my understanding also. Will. It is working with your will when you want to. Now, I'm not talking about the initial process of having received the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues. Uh, that may be a bit complicated for many people, but I'm talking about people who already can speak in tongues. Now, if you can't speak in tongues, I pray for you that God will give you his spirit. Close your eyes. Raise your hands, receive the Holy Spirit. Praying in tongues is very, very, very important because sometimes you are praying for things you do not know were actually going to occur. That day an accident may have been planned for you and you prayed it out of the way because you prayed in the Holy Ghost. You built on your most holy Faith. So speaking in tongues, uh, uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues, I, I, I believe you have gotten the essence of this gift, diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Diverse kinds of tongues is given in order for you to edify because it is coupled with the interpretation. So when you're operating in the gift 
rather than the, the prayer, which is for your own benefit. So the gift is meant for the benefit of others while praying in tongues or speaking in tongues is meant for your benefit. So when you have the gift of diverse kinds of tongues, you can go to people with messages. It could be a word of wisdom. It could be a word of knowledge. It could be a, a word of prophecy. It could be a revelation that is coming to you in another tongue because the Bible talks about tongues of men and tongues of angels, right? So you could be speaking in, another, in, an, in an unknown tongue and the interpretation becomes a prophecy or a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, right? I know you have been blessed uh, by, by this subject. We are, we are finally at the end of the Gifts of the Spirit series. We're definitely going to come back and redo this series later on to give you a more advanced explanation on these things. Uh, the Bible says, deep calleth unto deep, truth upon truth, precept upon precept, line upon line means first truth is the foundation. The second truth is built upon the first truth. The third truth is built upon the, the second truth. When you go deep, deep calls unto deep. So the fact that we have established the gifts of the spirit series at this level now does not mean this is all that there is to know. There's so, 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 so much more I would like to explain, but you need to have understood the basics first before you can then understand certain things in spiritual detail. And the information I've given you so far, if you take it to heart and practice what you have heard, trust me, you will begin to walk in the spirit, in, in the gifts of the spirit. So please do subscribe, hit that notification bell and share. Um, Bible Talks comes every Friday, 20 hours Central African time. I'm glad to, to be here with you, bring these subjects to you. I know for a fact that you are blessed to have been here to listen to this. And I'll see you on the next one. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.